Well, good morning, beloved Myrtle Grove family, friends, and guests. We're so glad you're assembled with us again today. And, uh, you know, especially if you're visiting with us, we just welcome you. Um, thanks for tuning in and being a part of our service today. We would love the opportunity to get to meet you personally. Um, if you don't have a church home, in fact, we'd love to even invite you to be here personally on Sunday morning. If that is uh, sort of workable and convenient for you, given the circumstances we're in, but we are having services 9 and 11, 15, and whenever uh, you're ready, we would invite you to be part of that. If you have any questions about how you might, you know, connect or anything like that, you can uh, email our church officer call or whatever. We'd, we'd love to um, just get to know you in some small way. I do want to say just a couple things at the outset. Um, sermon passage will come from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. So if you want to mark your spot there between now and then, I would invite you to do that, 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 22. And then a couple of quick announcements before I read a psalm for us to open our service. Um, so we have our healing service will be meeting on Tuesday. That was uh, canceled last week, but that will resume this Tuesday at 10 o'clock and meeting in the fellowship hall. So uh, if you want to be a part of that, we'd invite you to it. And then uh, we will have, speaking of visitors and guests, those who are uh, relatively new to the church, who are interested in joining our fellowship, we'll have a Next Steps class on uh, September 11th and 12th, so a Friday, uh, Friday night, Saturday morning kind of thing. And uh, so even if you're just interested in learning a little bit more about our church to know if that's kind of a direction you'd like to walk in. We would invite you to be part of that too. But an email has gone out from the church office. If you got that and you're interested in attending, please uh, let Vicki know that in the, in the office. And uh, if you didn't receive that email, you can contact her directly and, uh, and either give her your email address or give her that information or however uh, that might need to work out. But we, we would just like to know um, how many are planning to come so we have the appropriate space for that. That'll be here at the church uh, that Friday uh, night and Saturday morning. I think it's scheduled 6 to 8.30 probably on Friday night and then like 9 to 11.30 or something like that on Saturday morning. So we want you to know about those things coming up. And, um, you know, again, we, we're starting to have some activity resume and uh, kind of coming out of our little gopher holes or whatever as we've been huddled down for a little while and uh, glad to start seeing each other in a few more settings. Um, in fact, I should mention our UNCW missional community has started meeting again on Wednesday nights. Uh, we're actually here at church Wednesday nights a couple of, uh, couple of weeks out of the month, and then I'm um, actually off-site meeting with one of the student groups at UNCW. But um, that's available too if you're interested in being a part of that. Well, let me read from Psalm 105, just the first few verses of this as a call to worship to us today. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Well, I keep saying um, over and over, there's just more and more opportunity, it seems, to uh, sing praises to the, to the Lord, to tell of his wondrous works and glory in his holy name because there are uh, more and more people growing more and more despairing, I suppose, and uh, who need to hear that there's reason to rejoice and there's one in whom we can confidently place our hope and um, that we can cast our fears and cares upon. And so we're here to praise him today, to thank him as his people. And so let's bow together in prayer as we enter our time of worship. Would you join me in that? Lord, uh, you are our great and glorious God, and we do thank you for your goodness and the way you've shown that to us as your people, and we sing your praises today. God, as we come to you, we always need to remind ourselves, Lord, that we bring with us um, sins and burdens that we need to confess to you and ask forgiveness of, Lord, that we need to lay down before you uh, to be liberated from, the Lord, where I, sometimes our uh, uh, holding on to our cares is just an expression of unbelief on our part, a lack of faith, a lack of trust in you. And so, God, we want to very intentionally 
um, thoughtfully, purposefully lay those before you today. And that even now, as we enter a time of worship, itself is an act of worship. Um, we, we cast our burdens upon you. We offer to you a sacrifice of praise. And uh, Lord, we, uh, we trust that as you are exalted and you are glorified in this place, that we will be the ones most blessed from it. So would you minister to people? Uh, and all that they bring with them today, what they need to hear, what they need to experience, the way they need to encounter to you. Would, would, you, would you just be gracious to offer that back to them today? We give you ourselves and our time, and we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand together and uh, sing as the worship team comes and leads us.
Okay, we'll turn, if you haven't already, to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 to 22. We're finishing up our series on uh, 1 and 2 Timothy. 
In fact, I'll be moving on next to Philippians. It's a letter that has joy as its theme, and I think we need a healthy measure of that. But we're finishing up 2 Timothy uh, 9 to 22 today and uh, touching on the subject of companionship. You know, this pandemic has been a very isolating experience for, for most of us to some degree at some points, right? And probably it has been more isolating uh, for us collectively as a whole society than anything in our lifetime, where schools and businesses and churches have been you know, shut down or scaled back to one degree or another. Uh, many still are, right? And so the, the, the uh, interactions that we're accustomed to having, the activities that we're accustomed to being a part of and all the different ways we, we, uh, we see and relate with people have been diminished, truncated, or whatever, uh, however you might describe that. But we, the, the isolation has revealed or highlighted our basic human need for companionship. Uh, I, I've, I've heard lots of people describe that, and I think it's true even when people aren't conscious of it. One of the reasons for the um, agitation that we we all feel so commonly or that we see and hear in others is related to uh, this basic need that's not being met, our need for companionship with other people. So I want to speak to that subject this morning in a message I've just titled Faithful Companions. Faithful Companions, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 to 22. Let's look there now and I'll invite you and encourage you even to stand for the reading of the scriptures, especially in light of the message last week, as we listen to the voice of God in the text of scripture. Beginning in verse 9, reading out of the English Standard Version. Hear the word of the Lord. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prissa and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth and I left uh, Trophimus who was ill at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, we do thank you as always for your true and living word. We come to it with need and with expectation that you will speak to that need through it. You are able to do that in a profound and mysterious and wonderful way, Lord, as, as dozens or hundreds of people assemble to hear the same message spoken, you, by your Spirit, can minister uh, that message in hundreds of different ways. We ask that you would do that even today, as you know what's on our hearts. And so we ask that you would speak, O oh Lord, your word, by your spirit, through your servant to your people, and for your glory. Move me out of the way, as I always ask, and just use me as an instrument to communicate to your people. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, people are made to be in relationship. And of course, that's true by God's design. We read in the opening chapters of Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, he saw that it was good. You may remember that record in uh, Genesis 1 in particular. The first time something was said,
to be not good was after God had created man, but before he had created woman. Genesis 2.18 says, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, some of the women maybe are sitting there on the couch beside their husbands, elbowing them, saying, I told you so. And you're thinking, it's, it's not good for man to be alone, but it's especially not good for him to be alone with the children because I left him on one time and I just wouldn't even want to tell you the story. Well, that's probably another story for another day and maybe, maybe kind of uh, misses the point a little bit. But, um, but, but what's interesting is it just the first time anything about creation was said to be not good. And it wasn't because God made a mistake. He hasn't messed up. This was even before the fall. Sin had not entered the picture and corrupted creation in any way. Um, but it was incomplete. God's creation of uh, humanity as an image bearer was unfinished while man existed in isolation. Uh, two humans in a complementary companionship with each other were declared to be good when he created them, male and female. Of course, I, I would say, sort of parenthetically, he obviously had a special purpose in mind, and he, and, he, and he speaks to some of that purpose in those same opening chapters, that it was specifically the male-female relationship, his plans for reproduction and family and all of that um, that, that he's going to reveal. Uh, but it is, it is uh, true also and note, noteworthy uh, that a human being in isolation um, is not the way God intended for human beings to live. We're, we're social creatures. It is not good for man to be alone. I, I was reminded of that recently on a camping trip. Um, I think I mentioned that I had gone camping uh, some weeks ago by, by myself. And in fact, I should say uh, that was a decision uh, which a few people have, um, or for which a few people have questioned my state of mental health uh, and emotional health. Why would anybody go, uh, especially by themselves, out into the woods and sleep on the ground in a tent? Are you okay? Uh, and actually, yeah, I'm quite okay, and I don't need therapy. In fact, that was the therapy. But, um, but anyway, we, we usually go as a family, as I mentioned, and we couldn't coordinate our schedules, so I went by myself. And uh, I do uh, like some solitude. I had looked forward to a trip like that for some time, and I really did thoroughly enjoy it. But it was different. It was different. And I actually made note of this in my journal um, on probably the first day that I was there. But, but I, I, I wrote down that the joys were more muted when there was nobody there to share them with. The joys were more muted. So for example, some of the, some of the kind of basic and simple things that we've enjoyed for years when we go on camp and a beautiful sunset, um, a deer sort of trotting through the campground or rabbits and birds and the sound of rustling leaves, just basic things about being out in nature like that. Um, they're enjoyable, uh, they're wonderful and they're pleasant, but somehow those joys were just more muted when there wasn't somebody to turn to and say, look at that. Did you hear that? And that kind of experience. Now, many of you can relate to that on one level or another. In fact, there are probably, uh, there, in fact, there are certainly some. Whether you're watching right now, I don't know, but there are certainly some in our fellowship right now who are experiencing that kind of thing because they've recently lost a spouse or some other loved one close to them. And that person who has shared with them their joys for a lot of years suddenly isn't there and they find that the things that are enjoyable in life it just aren't as enjoyable as they're really intended to be because there's no one there uh, to share them with. People are designed to be in relationship and in the absence of companionship in life, um, our joys are muted and our sorrows are amplified. And so uh, each of us needs to find others um, to be companions to us, and we need to find others to be a companion for or to. And so God's word reveals to us here some characteristics of faithful companions. I want to just highlight four of those because this is really a precious and personal passage. But it, it, it tells us, among other things, that faithful companions are um, available, 
loyal, helpful, uh, and forgiving. I actually said that in the, in the, the, wrong, the last two in the wrong order. Available, loyal, forgiving, and helpful. I'll take them in that order. First of all, uh, faithful companions are available. So this whole letter has been leading to the point he makes in verse 9. It's different from other letters that he's written where the parting instruction would be something quite different about his steadfastness in ministry. In fact, he start, started his first letter to Timothy, um, I urge you to remain at Ephesus. He ends this second letter by saying, do your best to come to me soon. Do your best to come to me soon. Clearly, this is a matter of some urgency for Paul, right? He, he doesn't say, hey, I'd love to see you if it works out. Um, you know, if you, if, you can, if you can work it into your schedule. Hey, if you're, if you're, if you're up this way in Rome, uh, stop by and see me. There's an urgency to this. Do your best. Do thy diligence, it says in the King James Version, to come to me soon. Given all the difficulties that Timothy had had in Ephesus that Paul's written uh, and given him instruction about, he may have welcomed the opportunity to leave. Uh, you know, he, he, he might have just not needed a second urging to, to go see Paul in Rome. Uh, but that trip would have required quite a commitment. I mean, to travel from, from Ephesus on uh, the sort of the coast of Asia Minor, the sort of the far eastern reaches of the Mediterranean, and to travel to Rome would have, would have required some commitment. But Timothy was available. When Paul said, come, he knew Timothy would make himself available to come. I should mention also, uh, Tychicus was available too, and he's a guy we don't know a whole lot about. He probably uh, is the guy who was going to deliver this letter wherever he was and had been, um, that he's, he had served as a courier to deliver these letters from time to time. And he says uh, in verse 12, Tychicus, I have sent to Ephesus. It's very likely he'll be the guy who will relieve Timothy of his responsibilities for the time being in Ephesus so that Timothy can come to Rome. They're just available. And, you know, it's instructive to us because personal relationships just have to be a priority really for us as people, but especially in the Christian community. We, we, we have to build some margin into our lives. I spoke to this a couple of weeks ago even. But we have to make room for that to happen. You know, the church is often described using family terminology. We refer to each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, we have elders that are spoken of as sort of the, you know, the fathers of the church, if you will. But we, th there's that kind of language used. It is, it is very much uh, pictured, envisioned as that kind of relationship. But we often don't seek out in the church relationships of that sort that we want to develop to become close like family relationships. We in America and in the Western world are very individualistic in the way we live, very independent minded. We have our nuclear family very often. That's where we have close relationships and not a whole lot maybe outside of that. We need to make some adjustments to our schedules, our lives, and especially in the time that we're living in now because of the, the sort of nature of what um, pandemic has done to our world, uh, we need to regroup so that we can find ways to be available to one another. So uh, faithful companions are available. Number two, they're loyal. Uh, there's an interesting contrast here between uh, Demas and Luke in verses 10 and 12, or 10 and 11 rather. So Demas and Luke are mentioned only three times in the New Testament, and all three times they're mentioned together, pretty much in the same breath. So in Philemon uh, 1, 24, Paul refers to Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. It's one of those uh, just kind of passing mentions he makes of people, as he often does in his letters. In Colossians 4, 14, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. So Demas and Luke are both part of the inner circle, you know, the, the core leadership team, so to speak. At the, and they're on par with each other. 
but they finish very differently, don't they? <laughs> if, you, if you notice that as we were, re we were reading. While Crescens and Titus have probably just left to do ministry in other, uh, other areas. It just says they've, he's gone to Galatia or Dalmatia or whatever. It, Demas is another story. Verse 10 says specifically, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. So his, his main underlying problem lies in the fact that he loves this present world rather than the world to come. And, and, I, and I would say we might do ourselves a, a, a service by asking ourselves that question. How, how deep does our affection for this world really, really run? We might find deeper than we wish were true, that we love the world more than we ought to, and it, it hinders or inhibits our love for God. That's, that's Demas, Demas's main problem. But for Paul, it obviously gets more personal because he doesn't say that Demas has deserted the church. He doesn't say Demas has deserted us. He doesn't say Demas has deserted the gospel. It says Demas has deserted me. He was close Paul had a team that he administered with, uh, and it wasn't an enormous team, but there were, there were uh, a number of people who were close to him, and this was a very personal decision on Demas' part. He has deserted me. And it's the same thing he says about everyone <laughs> at his first defense in verse 16, if you caught that. Uh, he says, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against him, he says. But it, this would have probably referred to you know, the kind of trial system like he, uh, it's actually recorded in the book of Acts when he's first arrested and put on trial. He has, a, he has one hearing down in the sort of the region of Judea and he ends up like in prison for two years there before he ends up getting moved on to Rome. It could be a very delayed and protracted sort of process. And that's probably what he's referring to here. But everybody had, had uh, deserted him. That's how he, that's how he reported it like nobody came to stand with him and it's likely that everybody uh, understood the risk that was associated with Paul like with being a friend of Paul is a little bit like Peter denying Jesus when he was on his way to being crucified um, whether everybody intentionally deserted him for that reason we don't really know, but he says, nobody stood with me. Everybody deserted me. That's the category that Demas fell into. So the statement here is loaded with meaning. When he says in verse 11, Luke alone is with me. We're talking about the fact that a faithful companion is loyal and Luke is the picture of loyalty in that statement alone. Luke alone is with me. Besides the fact that he is a beloved physician, we really don't know much about Luke. He wrote the third gospel, of course. Uh, some of the distinctive characteristics of his gospel probably tell us something about him. He, he cares, seems to care about, he writes more about uh, the, the sick and um, marginalized people women and children, for example. So he seems to be a caring kind of person that would seem befitting of a doctor. In fact, uh, in the NIV, that verse in, in Colossians 4.14, which in most translations calls him the beloved physician, um, the NIV says, our good friend Luke the doctor. And, uh, th but again, beyond that, he, we don't know much about him. Um, but here in a dark hour, when everyone else is gone, he's simply present. He just, he's just there. And that meant everything to Paul in that relationship. It was powerful. And it's enough just to be present. Again, the, the instructive part of that for us is, is many times, especially when people are in deep need, presence is enough. Uh, but we need to have somebody in our lives that we can be that person for. Listen, everybody can't do that for everybody. And there's a lot of disappointment that arises out of people's expectations that maybe somebody is going to be there for them and then they're not and they're, and they're disappointed by that fact. Uh, everybody can't do that for everybody, but each of us 
can be that person for somebody. And certainly each of us needs there to be a somebody who will be that person for us. The faithful companion is loyal. Uh, number three, the faithful companion is forgiving. In, in, verses, uh, in verse 11, Paul says, get Mark and bring him with you. Now, this is a sweet statement. If you're familiar with the background story, you know why it's a sweet statement. If you're not familiar with the background, let me just fill you in and I'll give you sort of the sh shortest version of this I can. But back in Acts 13, when Paul and Barnabas go out on their first missionary journey, Mark goes with him. He's actually called John and other times he's called Mark and sometimes they refer to him as John Mark. But, but Mark went with them as kind of a, an assistant and after the first leg of the journey, when they got ready to sail to the next destination, Mark left and went back to Jerusalem. It doesn't tell us why. But meanwhile, it was a really difficult trip for Paul. He got stoned, left for dead on that trip, um, dragged to the edge of the city and so on. So sometime later, when Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to depart on the second missionary journey, Barnabas wants to take Paul, or sorry, Barnabas wants to take Mark, um, and Paul said no. In Acts 15, 38, it says, Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them in the work. So he had deserted them one time, and Paul thought it was not a good idea to take him again. And it says uh, that they had a sharp disagreement between them. And so Barnabas took Mark and went one way, Paul and Silas went the other way. The team actually split. It was a sharp division. Uh, it ended up being a multiplying kind of work, even though the team divided, the work was multiplied as they went two different directions. But whatever reasons uh, Mark had for withdrawing and going, going home, Paul at that time thought it disqualified him for continuing to serve with him. And so... What's interesting as, again, sort of a little footnote, shortly after that division, Paul meets Timothy. Uh, it's verses later. That, uh, that, that division happens at the end of chapter 15. In the early verses of 16, Paul meets Timothy. Timothy joins the team. Timothy becomes this faithful servant to Paul like he has, he has no other like Timothy, he'll say in another place. Um, so it very well may, may have been that, that, that Timothy essentially functioned as Mark's replacement on that team, which, which just makes it an interesting little uh, sort of speculation, I suppose, um, especially as the two are brought together here at the end of Paul's life. But obviously, somewhere along the way, Paul and Mark had been reconciled, and that required, listen, that required forgiveness to run in both directions. Because there are lots of people, you might be one of them. Uh, I, I could certainly sit here and remember probably uh, relationships where I've been on both sides of those kinds of experiences. Um, where I had upset somebody, there's this, you know, sharp division caused or whatever, you're on the receiving end of that kind of blow. And I've probably delivered it to other people too. But there can be for people a wound that lasts a lifetime. They, they live with resentment. Uh, they replay the incident over and over in their minds. They imagine and assume that the person still has ill feelings toward them. And that can go on for a lifetime. And so to be a faithful companion requires that we be gracious and forbear forbearing because that kind of hurt, maybe not to that same degree, but that kind of hurt is going to happen. And we have to be gracious and forbearing people that forgive and seek forgiveness. And so a faithful companion has got to be forgiving if it's going to be a lasting sort of relationship. Again, as it is in a family where you're going to live together, you're going to continue to live together for a lifetime. You have to learn how to forgive. So it is in Christian companionships as well. And then finally, uh, number four, a, a faithful companion is helpful. 
faithful companions helpful. This is the other part of what Paul says about Mark. Um, he says to Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you for he is very useful for me in ministry. Now I have to imagine that Mark needed to know that. And, and presumably he had come to understand that some time ago. Uh, they, they have been reconciled before this letter is written. Uh, as I read in one of the earlier uh, references, I think in Philemon, he mentions Mark as one of his fellow workers. They, they were restored sometime before that, but it had to have been important for Mark to know Paul regarded him as being useful in ministry because originally when he was disqualified from continuing to serve on Paul's team, Essentially, Paul made that decision on the basis of the fact that he was not useful. Like he did not consider him on balance to be useful or helpful. He thought anybody who would bail out in the middle of a journey like that was unhelpful, was explicitly, expressly unhelpful. You, you, you know, as if to say, it's, I'm better off not counting on him at all than to be counting on him and then he pulls out. And, and all of the chaos and confusion and whatever that that might have created, that somehow he thought he's better off without it or better off finding a replacement like maybe he did in Timothy. But Paul had, had considered him disqualified because he was unhelpful. And now that was different. Mark had something to contribute. He made the team better. He made Paul better. He's very useful to me for ministry. You know, being a helpful person in a relationship doesn't always mean agreeing, right, and affirming everything about what the other person says or does. Sometimes um, we can make that mistake of thinking a, a real faithful companion is somebody that always likes the comment on Facebook or uh, Instagram or whatever, you know, that, 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 that always is the one with an agreeable kind of comment to make. That is... That is not necessarily true. In fact, there are times when the inconvenient truth and the unwelcome truth is the most helpful thing you can offer to a true friend, even if it's initially painful, right? That, that actually, it can be helpful to say something that's actually a little bit oppositional at the moment. That might be in the long run the helpful thing. But to do that, of course, requires some discernment to know What's the right thing to say and when? Um, do I speak or do I withhold that thought for a more appropriate time? That requires, some, uh, that requires some discernment. By the way, it also involves getting it wrong sometimes. That's why we go back to number three, and we have to be forgiving, because sometimes somebody's gonna say something they mean uh, for, for our good, and it, it, it strikes us as being really insensitive, um, really poorly timed, and that kind of thing. And it, it might require us to circle back and be forgiving more, uh, more than one time. But, the, but the, the idea is that even then, uh, the, the, the companion who is attempting to be helpful is always seeking uh, and working for the welfare of the other person. We need people like that in our lives, don't we? We need people like that, who we know they're, they're for us. Even when they're, uh, even when they're for us just by being available, um, just by demonstrating their loyalty, uh, even when that requires us to forgive them and them to forgive us, that they're seeking our welfare because they're a helpful companion. And so I'll just you know, conclude by uh, s sort of restating something that I said at the beginning. That is when we're walking through life without real companionship, and, and many of us are walking through life without enough of it right now and have been for months, but when we're walking through life without real companionship, our joys are muted, our sorrows are amplified. But the presence of a faithful companion in our lives amplifies the joys and mutes the sorrows. And you could actually even think about that as being the, the chief aim of a good friend 
<laughs> particularly in these ways of being, of being a real faithful companion to somebody that we're seeking in life, in terms of our availability, our loyalty, our forgiveness and our usefulness, that we're, we're, we're seeking, how can we make life more joy, joyful for this dear friend? And how can we help reduce uh, the sorrows that they experience, or even just reduce the weight that those sorrows uh, add to their life, that that becomes our goal, our aim in that relationship. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that all of us probably need to take away as homework um, some questions about, do we have somebody like that in our life right now, a Christian companion? Um, outside of our own family relationships, do we have somebody like that? And are we that person for somebody else? And if and when the answer is no, and, I, and I'm certain the answer is no for many of us, the follow-up question would be, how do I need to make room in my life to first start making room for that person to be part of my life, room under my schedule for there to be a somebody else in my life? Um, and then how can I begin to seek new relationships in a new season of life that we're living? Where if this goes on, you know, where we're, uh, we're, we're just not um, defaulting to the same kinds of activities and so forth that we have in the past and the numbers of them. Um, if that goes on for some period of time, how then do we reorder our lives so that we still have companions and are companions in the Christian community to people who need it. Well, uh, we'll seek the Lord for that answer and then have feet, hopefully, to obey him as he gives us direction. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, thank you for this truth that you reveal. And thank you, Lord, that we do have uh, friends, family, loved ones, companions, to occupy life with us. It does make the colors of life brighter. Um, it does make the, uh, the resounding uh, uh, sounds of joyful living somehow more um, beautiful, more harmonious, in some cases louder. It just uh, enhances the very quality of life, and we know that is by your design. Uh, God, I pray that you would help the church and individuals in the church just see how we need to um, reorder our lives a little bit so that we can offer and seek out companionship that you've intended for us to have. So we lay that before you and pray, God, that you would show each one how we need to do this and, uh, that and indeed to give us the feet to obey uh, the direction you give. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we just want to use our response time today, uh, continuing with that prayer, uh, just making that a matter of prayer for yourself, maybe for others that you know right now are just experiencing loneliness. Um, for it's not even so much directly to the issue of companionship, but maybe they've experienced loss recently and and uh, they're going through a transition whether they want to or not. And um, maybe you want to pray for those people and uh, how you might be a companion in their lives or that God would send them uh, just that perfect compliment. However, though, the Lord would lead you to respond. Let's spend some time doing that now as the worship team leads us. Sometimes I my knees and pray come Jesus come let today be the day sometimes I feel like I Oh,
Well, we thank the Lord for um, what he's done and is doing in this service today. We thank the Lord for what he has done in us and in our congregation through this series. Um, it really is a special, precious and personal letter that ends on an especially personal note. And uh, we trust that God is gonna continue to minister the truths of that to us. And, um, and it will change not only our church, but the church because of what he's doing in the world right now. 
and, and we just want to be obedient to him and however he would lead us. Well, I'm going to invite you now, if you'll stand for the benediction and then remain standing as we sing the doxology together as our parting song. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Mm -hmm.